that brought you to uh, Nuremberg. For example, what were you doing before the war? I was in Washington and in the office in the Department of Justice, that, uh, holding the office in the Department of Justice as an assistant attorney general, which would normally uh, have had responsibility for, uh, under the Attorney General, uh, for uh, uh, formulating the uh, Department's position on the problems that came to us, uh, we were not brought into the thing uh, as uh, actors in the prosecution. Uh, that was dealt with by the uh, Office of War Crimes Prosecution that was specially <coughs> set up by executive order of the President uh, and uh, was uh, first first appointee to that office was Mr. Justice Jackson, a very unusual thing for a uh, Justice of the Supreme Court to uh, take such an office, and many people, myself included, thought that he ought not to have uh, taken it. The Chief Justice thought that he ought not to have taken it. The Chief Justice was Colin Fish Stone. First thing I it came to me uh, in that way uh, was a memorandum that came to the Department of Justice from the White House, uh, whence it had been uh, directed to the Attorney General personally. He bucked it to me, uh, uh, and this this was the first memorandum that uh, Bernays had prepared. He being on the staff, uh, this memorandum. Uh, that he prepared, in which he proposed a plan for dealing with the uh, uh, top functionaries, uh, German and Italian. Uh, this was a point where uh, our victory was no longer conjectural or problematic, uh, but uh, the war was still going on. Uh, uh, Assistant Secretary of War, as the department was then the War Department, you know, not the Defense Department, uh, was John McCloy. And uh, he was the person who acted for Secretary Stimson on this whole subject, uh, as he did on many other subjects. He was, uh, of course, the McCloy of the Tweed Law Firm in New York and a uh, fine lawyer and interesting man. Um, I don't know what his initial reaction to Bernays' memorandum was, but uh, by the time I got to conferring with him for Bill, uh, he had really had kind of preliminary expression of favorable interest from Stimson. Uh, and uh, so there was a group, uh, 
working with Bernays, there was a group that uh, was more the creature of the uh, of a higher echelon, which I'll call the McCloy echelon. Uh, Stimson, uh, though he, he was good about maintaining lines of authority and uh, respecting the delegation that he had made to McCloy to uh, pull the War Department's uh, uh, work and position together and, and uh, to ride herd on it. But uh, in addition, uh, he had a habit of consulting people in the law whom he had regard for. Uh, none that I recall who, uh, uh, who knew anything about military law or really had any background or made any significant contributions. It was uh, Renee's working with McCloy, uh, Amai Cutter, now, uh, who later became a justice of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. What started it for me was finding on my desk one morning with a little note indicating that it was urgent uh, this first Bernays document. Now, that document is available, and you've no doubt seen it. Uh, it's the financial of What I thought about it and what I told the Attorney General uh, is in that memo of mine. Uh, as you look at it, you'll see that I was uh, negative questioned at least the uh, idea the whole idea of setting up a uh, trial in which uh, uh, which lacked the uh, conventional uh, qualities of a contested uh, proceeding and uh, forced representation on individuals who might then be, who would then be subjected to criminal sanctions on the basis of a proceeding in which they had only uh, marginal participation. But I was interested at the beginning in, uh, in educating the people I was writing for educating them in the distinction that Bernays had never articulated between the Anglo-American law of conspiracy and the views of the rest of the world uh, towards uh, that crime or that concept of crime. He never really Bernays never got this point, really. He never really differentiated between the charge of complicity and the charge of conspiracy in the Anglo-American pattern as an inchoate crime. It's crime whether you carry out the conspiracy or not. Well, uh, the French immediately uh, had their hackles up on that point. Uh, of course, the British were familiar with that approach because the, the British have it, and indeed that's where we got it. But, uh, but, uh, uh, and the Russians uh, had it, though, for different reasons. But, uh, uh, and, and, and the way the Russians used it uh, indicated really why uh, in the French tradition uh, uh, there had never been acceptance or G 
general acceptance of the idea that uh, planning to commit a crime is the equivalent of committing the crime. Committing the crime. Um, well, I, I, I drew that out, and the main thrust of my memorandum was to uh, contend that <clears throat> if the laws of war were invoked, in what was to be, in effect, a criminal prosecution, that while the idea of complicity as part of the, uh, as an accepted idea in the laws of war as well as in, in criminal law, ordinary criminal law, uh, generally throughout the world, in all, in all types of systems, uh, uh, that it was appropriate for us to regard uh, the idea of complicity as part of the laws of war, but it was uh, rather questionable uh, whether this peculiar uh, Anglo-American uh, concept, uh, uh, which had not been accepted in the Napoleonic uh, countries that mainly followed in the Napoleonic Code, uh, I, I raised the question whether we ought to do that, and the more so since we were in a situation where uh, to talk about the conspiracy not having been acted upon was ludicrous. It had been acted upon, so that the whole uh, notion of conspiracy as an inchoate crime uh, it was really gratuitous in this situation. And here uh, it was being proposed uh, that the United States of America act on this idea and propose to our allies that it should be acted on, that this idea should be acted on, uh, when we would then be taking on wholly unnecessarily an opposition which indeed did arise and was, uh, became political even when Senator Taft took it up. Uh, when there was no need to do that because the entire objective could be achieved uh, through invoking the general idea of complicity and we didn't even have to charge that the conspiracy is a crime because the effect of complicity is, as the word implies, to uh, develop liability for the completed offense that is committed, that is, slave labor or murder, whatever uh, the case may be. Well, the Attorney General immediately agreed with me, and the, uh, uh, that was the basic thrust of our uh, contention uh, in the intra-departmental uh, negotiations and struggle that uh, as to how far the Bernays plan was acceptable. The, the, the final, I guess I can characterize the final result uh, that we didn't object to utilizing the terminology of conspiracy so long as uh, liability determinations uh, required proof uh, of, of, of the completion of at least some of the criminal objects of the plan. Well, all of them, uh, we have plenty of evidence and knew that we could acquire plenty of evidence of, uh, you know, illegal killing of civilians, uh, uh, illegal killing of prisoners, uh, slave labor. All of these were really uh, uh, well-defined military offenses. Uh, under the laws of war, all offenses uh, capital, or maybe capital, uh, well, 
that that point is brought out uh, very preliminarily in the first memorandum that I that I uh, wrote, and uh, you know, in the subsequent drafts, uh, really, our, our prime objective, our Department of Justice, uh, was to be sure that the concept of conspiracy, when it was used, was used only in the sense of complicity, and that the limits that Anglo-American law imposed on uh, substantive liability by way of complicity uh, were respected. Well, they were respected, uh, or claimed to be respected, in the formulation of the charges, ultimately, and more importantly, they were uh, fully articulated in the judgment of the tribunal. Of course, it was a funny situation because while uh, I would say that Bernays had more influence on the prosecution, he had, of course, exactly that influence which was embodied in the extent to which Justice Jackson agreed with him. He had no influence uh, apart from that. He, um, But uh, in any event, uh, insofar as he had Jackson's support and agreement, he was more influential than we were on the early stages, at the early stages. But then when Biddle was appointed to the court, uh, and partly when I went with him as his, uh, Felix Frankfurt used to to say as his law clerk and uh, other people <laughs> put a somewhat uh, uh, more flattering uh, designation for the role that I played, but I really was served as his assistant judge, and uh, I wrote some of the opinion and, uh, of the court. I had no standing. On my own. I don't think people realize uh, how far in the uh, in the court's treatment of this uh, vicarious liability uh, issue, uh, the court uh, the court really did not fully subscribe to uh, Bernays uh, uh, concept and if if it had you couldn't have had the acquittals that took place uh, shock could not have been acquitted and uh, but it came up also with uh, uh, with Dönitz and uh, I, there I know Biddle voted to uh, quit I quarrel with the post-trial literature is mainly that I don't think any of the writers uh, um, really understood this point that I've just been very inarticulately trying to uh, put before you. Uh, I had it in the, I guess, in the little piece that I did. I'm 44-45 when these issues are being thrashed up. They're very tangled. Uh, they're very difficult. They're not going to be clear. What would have been your frame of mind in that period to have learned that towards the end of the war, these major criminals had been trotted out by some military unit and uh, after some kind of summary military process had been shot? Well, it depends who they were. Let's say Garen. I think I would have uh, defended the legality of that without any doubt. How would you have felt about as a, a proper moral solution to the guilt of these people? I, I would have 
wept no tears about going. Uh, there were others I felt I'd have felt differently about. Yeah. But uh, on the other hand, I would have thought it unwise. And uh, as a person in a responsible place in the American government, I would have thought that we'd slip very badly in uh, leaving that an issue as momentous as that to uh, uh, a, uh, a diffuse solution. Uh, that is, if, if the uh, officer in charge of the uh, district in which uh, Goering's body happened to be at that time uh, was to make a decision of that sort rather than the uh, commander-in-chief and president of the United States, uh, I would have thought that our governmental organization was going, had gone to hell, but uh, and obviously it wouldn't happen that way. I no. mean, it was a governmental it was a governmental decision of the highest level right. uh, that ought to have been made, and it was made. But you, you, you're, you're more comfortable with the outcome. Uh, oh, much more. Yeah. Okay. Much more. I, uh, I never talked to Churchill about this, but I, I did speak to Anthony Eden uh, at the time of the San Francisco conference. Uh, Eden was there, and uh, the matter was taken up. Uh, uh, Judge Rosenman was then acting for us by uh, de special designation of the president. It was just before uh, Jackson's appointment as, as uh, chief of counsel. And uh, I, I was at the session in San Francisco, at which uh, um, Eden made a little speech. Uh, it was the beginning of the session. Uh, um, Secretary of State was still stetinious at that, at that time, and uh, uh, he had not had any personal contact with this war crimes issue because uh, Rosenman had been handling it uh, directly for the White House. And, and uh, the purpose of this meeting, from our point of view, uh, <clears throat> was to get the British finally to stop shuffling their feet and to uh, agree with uh, our proposals. Uh, I, I remember uh, Eden made a little speech. What Eden said uh, uh, in substance was, as you know, uh, uh, our government has uh, not been in favor uh, of a major uh, trial uh, for uh, reasons of prudence about the way in which the defendants would conduct themselves, uh, but uh, in view of the strength of feeling of the United States on this issue, uh, the uh, government has uh, decided to put aside uh, its own doubts and difficulties and uh, join in uh, a joint uh, venture. Uh, a very dramatic moment, uh, really. But from that point on, the British were absolutely great, and Church that view of Churchill never, never emerged any further. What FDR's personal feeling was about the trial. I can find the historic documentary record, but I wonder if you'd ever heard what he may have expressed in his own words. Uh, no, uh, except that I 
think I know enough to know that uh, he was not disposed to uh, pay any attention to the critics of the gambit. Uh, and when Taft became the only member of Congress, really, of either House to uh, actually articulate objections to what was going on while the trial was still going on, uh, it, it quite naturally uh, operated, I guess, to uh, solidify his lack of interest in any serious discussion of the merits. There's no doubt, I think, that he wanted the Germans killed off. And, uh, uh, but I think he was persuaded by Jackson that a trial, rather than summary execution, uh, was the right thing. Can you construct reconstruct for me in your mind's eye your arrival at the city of Nuremberg. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do indeed. I remember the first view I had of it from the air, of course. Um, a very dramatic uh, experience, actually. I mean, it, at the beginning, uh, you're approaching a city. And then there comes a point as you plane comes down somewhat and, uh, and now what strikes you about the city that you're approaching is that there's something strange about it. Uh, for one thing, there's no light anywhere. Uh, and then you see that there are no window panes. And then when you get a little closer, uh, you begin to see that what you're looking at is not a city, but a ruin. Uh, I, I remember that as if it were yesterday. And it was the first sight, uh, uh, encounter that I'd have, the first view uh, of uh, the type of extensive uh, bombing damage that uh, there was in Berlin. Then, of course, when we later when we went to Nuremberg, a smaller city, but even more damage. And uh, um, well, it doesn't take you long to figure out that it's a ruin and uh, not a city in the normal. Sense, but I remember that very well indeed. I guess we were the first. We were the first uh, little organization. My wife came over with Mrs. Biddle. I think they were probably the first two uh, unemployed women to. Uh, have leave to come over and uh, uh, that was a source of tension between uh, Jackson and Biddle because he had been uh, very reluctant to see the situation change and have his staff people uh, able to bring out bring their wives if they were married uh, Biddle was always nasty about that and <laughs> attributed Jackson's uh, uh, view uh, to the state of the relationship domestically between Bob and his wife. Uh, it's true that that was not a good marriage and uh, I think it was pretty well believe generally that uh, uh, Jackson was having an affair anyhow with his secretary, Mrs. Douglas. Uh, he was hostile to uh, uh, having those wives there, whether it was because he thought it would cut down on the uh, 
the productivity of the people working for him, or whether, as uh, Biddle thought, it was because he didn't want his own wife there and wouldn't know how to keep her out if other wives were. were how, how, how might some of his uh, unhappiness with that situation manifest itself? How would you have known that was his attitude? Well, I talked to him about it. I mean, um, naturally, our group, uh, insofar as the people involved were married, that was a bit of, uh, uh, and myself and uh, Jim Rowe and Bob Stewart, and Parker's law clerk, let's call him. Uh, I guess that was all that uh, yeah. Quincy Wright was not married and a uh, widower. Widow, yeah. How did you get around? What kind of transportation? I had a car and a driver. Provided by the military? Yeah. More civilian clothes, you and the other members of the Yes, uh, um, in some of the civilian enterprises, uh, everybody who engaged uh, wore a, uh, uh, an imitation of an officer's, uh, uh, you know, gabardine. Uh, like a war correspondent. Yes. We're yeah. military, but no rank. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but in our situation, uh, uh, Justice Jackson was very strong for the notion that uh, nothing of military uh, origin or uh, model uh, was appropriate, and uh, Biddle went along with that. I think Jackson felt me more strongly even than Biddle about, about it. We all had assimilated ranks, though, and uh, that, that in that kind of setup, really, really crucial because, well, mainly just on the distinction between officers and, and, and others would affect the food that you could get, the place where you could eat, and, Kind of barbarous, but true. It hasn't changed. No. Um, what was your equivalent rank? I, I think my card just said uh, field officer. You've done your work in the morning. You're breaking for lunch. Where would you go? We would go to a dining room in the courthouse, uh, which was not specially set up for us, but set up for, uh, and, but not open to everybody, uh, and, and uh, so the others who might be there would be uh, ranking people in the prosecution who were numerous. We were few, and they, I mean, this little group around the judges was, consisted of a handful of people, whereas there were hundreds in the yeah. prosecution staff. But I can't, we came, well I came uh, first. Um, we had a little delegation that left together. There was uh, Biddle and Parker and uh, Quincy Wright and Bob Stewart and, uh, and um, Jim Rowe and uh, Biddle and myself. So it comes to about eight or nine people. This was a very special responsibility. Uh, I, I was very fond of and close to uh, Biddle. Uh, he was as close a friend uh, as uh, I think uh, another man could have. He was older than I, about ten years older, I guess, and, uh, 
but he uh, he was protective of me, uh, helpful to my career, and I felt close to him for that reason. But over and above and beyond that, uh, I cared a great deal about him. It was, uh, the difference in age didn't really matter very much. It, you, you know, that, that happens. Uh, yeah. Now that I'm in my 80s, uh, uh, I have similar relations with many youngsters, student, students and others, uh, and uh, I think I can say that uh, there too. Uh, that relationship is not really greatly affected by the differences in, uh, difference in age. Uh, I was very protective of Fiddle. I think I was more protective of him than, uh, than he, of me. Uh, uh, he had an important political career. He, uh, he was uh, not in the position of a man who was retired from a career, and, uh, uh, and he was not always the most self-protective uh, person in his uh, public life. Partly this was uh, due to uh, a certain, he had a certain innocence uh, that was very unusual in the Washington of that time, or I guess of, of any time. I was deeply devoted to Mrs. Biddle, a lovely, charming woman, uh, and uh, she was to me, I think, too, in a sort of maternal way, uh, and, uh, and I, I felt very strongly that I had to protect Biddle against his own foolishness. How would you describe the difference in character between Biddle and Jack? Well, they were as different as people, two people can be. Uh, Biddle was straightforward and uh, uh, candid and was not an intriguer. Uh, Jackson, Jackson was much more knowledgeable in Biddle about the vagaries of public life, the perils of public life. Uh, he had a much sounder PR, uh, a set of PR awarenesses uh, than, uh, than Biddle. But they, uh, they also shared uh, traits. Uh, they were very similar politically. They were uh, truly liberal people in the political sense, uh, courageous people politically, uh, quite prepared to stick their necks out, and uh, little somewhat prepared to do it even when it was unnecessary to do it. Uh, little was impulsive. And Jackson was not. Jackson was cagey. Um, and I, I don't mean to use that word in any, you know, in any depreciatory sense, really. It, 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 Jackson had much more experience in politics than Biddle did. They were, they were about the same age. But Jackson was a better lawyer than Biddle. He was more of a lawyer than Biddle. Uh, Biddle was a very good lawyer. Uh, Biddle, you know, had been a judge uh, of the uh, Third Circuit Court of Appeals, a very important federal court, and he just hated every minute of it. The only reason he had accepted it was that <clears throat> President Roosevelt uh, had indicated to him that he wanted to appoint him attorney, uh, a solicitor general. Yeah. 
and uh, it was the view of everybody that his appointment as Solicitor General, uh, having been uh, what a railroad lawyer, you know, counsel for the Pennsylvania Railroad, uh, uh, that a period as Solicitor General, a, a period uh, uh, in public work and judicial work. Uh, would make his appointment as Solicitor General, his nomination as Solicitor General, more acceptable. And so he went on the Third Circuit uh, Court with, uh, with every expectation uh, that he'd not stay there long, but would get back into law practice uh, as Solicitor General. And so it, so it worked out for him. Jackson, on the other hand, who uh, had been in law practice entirely before he went on the bench, both some public, some as a public servant, some some much more in private practice, uh, so that he didn't require any uh, uh, acclimatization to. Uh, do what he finally wanted to do when he was appointed Solicitor General. The one who was joined initially, and then they found out that he wasn't physically or mentally, Jackson was terribly disappointed uh, that this old man couldn't be tried as a he, uh, I don't think he, he had any difficulty uh, uh, with the idea that, in fact, uh, the individual involved, and who was named as a defendant in the indictment, uh, couldn't be. Uh, but what the Americans did was to come forward at that point with a proposal that his son be substituted as a defendant. Well, the bill was absolutely outraged at that notion, and uh, you remember the tribunal declined to do that. Uh, well, Jackson almost had a nervous breakdown. He was so sore at them for not doing it because, you see, it destroyed his conception of a trial with representative, uh, with defendants from every branch of life that contributed to the war and, and shared the guilt of the war as he as he viewed it, but uh, uh, it illustrates, I think, that uh, Justice Jackson was not a man who uh, could accept being thwarted. Was, was Jackson's attitude, uh, would you say, strictly uh, his, his sense of, of of power and, and not wanting to be brooked, or was there a, a sense of, of, of moral righteousness and wanting to nail these SOBs? Well, I think it was uh, both, actually. But I think the uh, I think it was frustration primarily, and uh, I mean, better word simply. Uh, accepted uh, the, the way every lawyer has to learn. That's the first thing you need to be able to do to be a decent lawyer is to uh, understand that uh, there will be among your defeats in your career some cases that you think no reasonable man could have differed with you about. Uh, on the uh, acquittal of uh, Chuck, 
which we never accepted. Yeah. Well, any objective person I think would have to grant that uh, shocks guilt on a proper definition of guilt, I mean, of what makes one guilty, uh, was certainly problematical. Uh, and I don't say that a reasonable person couldn't have believed that shock ought to have been convicted, but I don't believe one could say that uh, uh, his acquittal Implying a judgment that what he did was not uh, necessarily uh, uh, motivated by what he was charged with. He was charged with uh, seeking to accomplish. But not, not so with Jackson. I, I was not impressed. I, I was not impressed. And, and uh, the difficulty of it is that uh, you knew you knew that politics would come first. Yeah. Uh, and while there's a certain sense, perhaps, in which uh, politics and law can never be wholly, totally separated. Uh, I had the sense that our people were much uh, not only capable of greater objectivity in their judgment, but disposed towards greater objectivity. Yeah. And, and, and that, that, that's an important, it's important, of course, to recognize the difference uh, between a person engaged in legal work in government in our system and a person engaged in legal work as a representative of a private party. Uh, but uh, the government lawyer uh, certainly has the greatest opportunity to uh, exercise objectivity in uh, judgment, uh, he's he has duties to his client that may run counter to his convictions, yeah. but they uh, they're of a different order of compulsion than the private attorney uh, representing a private interest. You recall the first time you ever set eye on any of the defendants. Well, what would have been in the courtroom? Was it the day the trial opens when they're marched in? Yeah. What was your reaction, recollection of that moment? Well, no, uh, only the obvious. I mean, the importance of the occasion. I mean, maybe actually getting a good look at these bastards. <laughs> feeling that time, but uh, 